right, Barney Miners, welcome back after a bloody WA public holiday. And tell you what, this would have to be the biggest fucking capital raise I've ever seen. Yeah, it's big, mate. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Anyway, we will tell you who, what, where and when and how bloody big coming up soon. Mate, 29 medals, CEO change, lads. Uh, mate, love a battle. Plenty of battles out there. Nothing up there more than the battle for Nianzaga. <laughs> Just battles, battles. <laughs> Everyone wants a gold project. Everyone wants a battle. <laughs> Love it. Mate, first quantum, P PGMs. PGMs. We're going to talk about – PGMs? Zim Platinum group medals, mate. We're going to talk it's about – isn't it? Yeah, you could say either. PGEs, PGMs, fucking – Whatever you like, mate. mate. We're talking Amplats, Zimplats, Implats, <laughs> any sort of plats you want. Oh, bloody love it, mate. <laughs> oh, good old Wildcat back in the news. Bit of bloody exceptional gold coming out of Spartan. And, mate, tell you, money miners, we've got a bit of a dreadful thing to tell you. Big announcement. Big announcement. After doing, like, over 200 daily shows every weekday, basically. We're finishing the podcast. No more. No, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, we wouldn't do that to you, money miners. <laughs> Fuck, especially we've got rent bills to pay. <laughs> we're going to four a week. Yeah. Instead of five. We're testing it out, mate. You know the worst thing about it? What's that? It's two ads less that I get to rip. I'm yeah. devastated. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is sad. But any, anyway. Which, <laughs> which means tomorrow being a, a Wednesday and, you know, every subsequent Wednesday, at least for this month, and we're, we're going to test and see how it goes. There won't be a Money of Mine episode release. You're going to have to wait till Thursday. There you go. And Maybe you listen to, to Tuesdays twice. And there's no <laughs> – you cannot whinge anymore that there's too much content because there's a bit less now. But quality. <laughs> Mate, less is more sometimes. Only four episodes a week. <laughs> Can the quality get higher? <laughs> you can always get higher, Matty. 1% better every day, mate. We're about to see. Mate, Benny Feingold, the Uranium Endgame episode has gone absolutely off its tits. Uh, mm -hmm. Mate, head back and watch it if you haven't already. She's flying. I think it's going to be our fastest episode to 10,000 views, mm. Matty, which is um, – Sorry, Joe Lowry. Yeah, yeah. Gorski's it was, big mm. fella. It was neck and neck with um, him and Joe's episode, and then I was just tracking since published. It looks like Benny's going to just – just beat him. Quite the metaphor, isn't it? Uranium's in vogue. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Every, I, I want to I want to plug the uh, the chat we had with Dan Porter as well, guys. I reckon that was a uh, a ripping chat. We chucked that one up yesterday, and I reckon well well worth your time. A bit of a different different strategy, money miners for companies putting out debt, which is a big red flag for us normally in the developer end of town and the juniors, but. I found that chat fascinating too. Yeah, mate. Give money miners do yourself. Give give yourself a bloody free holiday and go listen to Dan Porter the Savvy. Simple as bloody that. <laughs> listen hey, to, to, to well said, mate. Well said. Show. Exactly. Catch up. <laughs> Righto. Now, this has anyone ever done a US two point one billion dollar capital raise? This is like IPO freaking level, like <laughs> size. This is huge. Two point one billion capital raise, and the winning contestant is Albemarle. It's a big number, but it's I think it's big for us because we talk about Aussie mining stocks. You don't really see it too much for the Aussie in the Aussie West mining stocks, but um, <laughs> but. But Maddie, it, we're going to um, we're going to talk about uh, First Quantum later on, and they gave it a run for their money. They raised one point one five billion, as well as a one point six billion dollar bond offering. So mm -hmm. all up over two point seven. Oh, oh. Canaccord and Euros Hartley's pick up your game up these bloody up <laughs> these numbers, <laughs> eh? Open, open. <laughs> yeah, well, you need a big bloody balance sheet to underwrite these kind of deals. Um, yeah. So what's got, going on? Well, mate, Albemarle, the mighty Albemarle, they're effectively undertaking a $2.1 billion capital raising, like you said. And instead of a you know typical capital raising, like you can see for the ASX listed companies, this is an offering of a mandatory convertible preferred stock, um, which is basically a, a hybrid debt and equity instrument that will um, list separately on the on the NYSE, this instrument that holders of this security effectively will receive like a coupon. Um, they call it the dividend rate until 2027, at which point the security converts to common stock at a predetermined conversion rate. But the simple way to think about it is Albemarle is diluting their capital structure to raise funds just like a capital raise. Which is not common <laughs> in a way. Mm. Like for a company this size, correct or not, but of this magnitude? The US public markets are a bit different. Like there, there are, there's, there's a, you know, much more 
much deeper access to, to capital pools over there. There, like you know, you could do hybrid instruments of this kind of quantum. You couldn't couldn't do this on the on the Australian markets at all. Mm. Um, but it it like it is. It's still interesting. You don't see it very often. And um, you know why 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 are we seeing it right now? I think we're gonna we're gonna unpack that, aren't we, JD? Yeah, <clears throat> Maddie. To, to your point on the the scale of it, it's worth you know putting it into context for the the scale of the company. So they kept it. US fifteen point six billion last time I looked. So yeah, pr- pretty huge raise. The the read through is is fascinating, and you know we're obviously going to get into why we think they are getting into it. There's a there's a quote that stood out from the the boss of the company there, Kent Masters, into why they are doing this capital raise. So intends to be intends to use net proceeds from the offering for general corporate purposes which may include funding growth capex, e.g. construction or expansion in Australia as well as China, as well as repaying outstanding commercial paper. And read there it, we have it. I think it that's the uh, I, J, D. <laughs> read it backwards every time, mate. So let's get into it. They had $890 million of cash and cash equivalents when they last reported. That was at 31st December. But that debt portion has been on a, on a pretty rapid rise, hasn't it, Trav? Yeah, mate. Like the... The total indebtedness at 31 December was US $4.3 billion, of which US $625 million was earmarked as requiring to be repaid this um, calendar year as a, as a current liability. What's more is that we could see they were under some pressure with their indebtedness relating to the, the covenants of their facility. This quote was in their recent earnings release. On February 9th, 2024, Albemarle completed an amendment to its credit agreement to ensure ongoing financial flexibility. The amendment uses an updated adjusted EBITDA definition in the company's financial covenant, which includes Taliesin equity income on a pre-tax basis. This presentation more closely represents the materiality and financial contribution of the strategic investment in Taliesin, smooths the impact of price variations and inventory timing, and more closely represents a measure of EBITDA. And if you read the annual report... They're even more explicit, right? The February 2024. More explicit than that. Far out. <laughs> well, that's just very verbose and wordy, and you're yeah. like, oh, just sounds like they they changed the covenant for, um, you know, to be to be more reflective of the business. But it's actually because they were under pressure of breaching the covenant. Here, here we see the February 2024 amendment was entered into to modify the financial covenants under the 2022 credit agreement to avoid a potential covenant violation over the following 18 months, given the current market pricing of lithium. So I went into the notes of the annual report and read what the covenant had been changed to. And then I went to the annual report for the year before that and read what the covenant used to be. And I've charted it up visually here so the YouTube viewers can actually see what I'm talking about. Previously, Albemarle had to ensure their leverage ratio was below 3.5 times for all its fiscal quarters. So that's debt, debt to EBITDA. Yeah. Yep. They, yep. you know, they, there's like some adjusted EBITDA there, and um, they, you know, they use some some tweaks to the metrics to sort of capture the effect of, of, of Talisman and the likes. But yeah, that's right. The leverage ratio, um, and the amendment allows Albemarle now, as a result of this amendment, to have an elevated leverage ratio for five specific quarters, peaking as high as five point five times in the September quarter this calendar year. The the way the leverage ratio is measured changed also. Um, you know, and I interpret that definition just to capture the impact of that Winfield JV to Albemarle's uh, debt servicing capability better. But this amendment didn't come for free. You don't just get more lenient you know, covenant for nothing. Um, to kind of offset it, you now see the, the they've got a new covenant that they have to um, abide by. And this one is um, an interest coverage ratio that now applies to, to, to Albemarle as well. Just give me a bit of rope here, Trav from finance guru that you are. So they've got their debt covenant increase, which means they can hold more debt, but they're raising money as well. Yeah. Is there a bit of a, like a double whammy here? Like even with the extra debt covenant, they might still breach that debt covenant with the way lithium's doing? What's going on? Well, if you think of like in simple terms, if your leverage ratio is measuring your net debt to EBITDA, what happens if EBITDA goes absolutely kaput, right? Which happens in cyclical businesses when the commodity price goes mm. to the toilet. Um, if, you, if your EBITDA goes down the drain, even if you are, you know, if you if you have a higher threshold, which they the amendment allowed them to do, have run, run higher leverage, um, you can still like, you know, you can still be under covenant pressure because, you know, your, your lower earnings really just annihilates that kind of um, the, the, the denominator. 
it's like a, a, a negative leverage. Uh, like I say, I assume it could exponentially get out of control. Yeah, that debt covenant ratio. <laughs> if you div- if you divide <laughs> if something by prices divide by ten, which they've done. <laughs> yeah, if you think if if it's net debt divided by EBITDA, what happens if you're dividing by zero, mate? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm not saying that they have zero EBITDA, but you, you see what I mean, like just from a mathematical yeah. sense. So of course, what does improve things though is if you reduce your debt quantum, um, and then all of a sudden that helps the numerator, which help, helps you, you you stay in line with your covenants better. But I've seen some um, pretty interesting. Uh, takes out there in relation to, to you know, oh, Al- Albemarle's raising two, you know, all this money, $2 billion. What are they going to buy? Who are they about to bid for in our lithium world? And I think that's a bad take because it ignores the real balance sheet stress that the company's enduring right now. And if you, if you want to speculate, um, you know, when Albemarle might be in a position to even think about doing real M&A, then I look at this clause of the, the, the debt government covenant. Effectively, Albemarle can have a more lenient ratio if they acquire something um, you know, using debt after the 30th of June, 2025. So I wouldn't be getting your knickers in and not expecting them to have a big swing at anything before then. Um, so like, don't be mistaken. I th- think this is clearly an equity r- raise to relieve balance sheet distress. And it's as simple as that. And I even reckon Albemarle should probably send some flowers to to Gina as a bit of a thank you gift for ruining the, the Lion Town <laughs> deal because they'd, they'd be, this would be a lot uglier for them if, um, if that deal proceeded. My geez, bloody, oh, Tony Rivera would be sending some bloody flowers to her too. She'd be getting flowers from everywhere these days. <laughs> would have been a fruitful Valentine's Day for Miss Reinhardt, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, think you're, I think you're bang on the money there, Trav. You don't, first of all, change the, the covenants and try and renegotiate the covenants in your in your debt unless, you know, you're under some sort of strife and you have to. Like, you're not going to do that during rosy times. And it sort of flies in the face a bit of um, the, the rally we've seen in lithium prices of late from on the sort of numbers that I looked at, it's bounced from uh, 850 bucks a ton to 980 or almost a thousand on other sort of measures. And it's put a bit of a damper on the whole sector. When I looked earlier today, almost every single lithium name had come off, you know, substantially between five and 10 plus percent. Very good, JD. Trav, mate, 29 medals. In addition to all this bloody share price action, they've got a new CEO, boys. They do indeed, yeah. James Palmer, uh, after nearly 20 years with BHP, is joining, is running the show at 29 medals. Now, James, if you're listening, mate, not sure if you know, but you have a bit of a water problem at Capricorn Copper. So, (laughs) and lads, when you've got any water problem, you need to get wet. Maddie, is this your way of introducing a new sponsor? We have a new partner. <laughs> Get wet, mate. Whether you've got too much water, whether you've got not enough water, or you just want to get water from A to B, you need to bloody get wet. <laughs> it is as fucking check this bloody humdinger of a thing out. I'll tell you what I'm looking oh, at, oh, mate. Oh, shit. That's, uh, sorry, that is a giant goon bag. Uh, sorry about that. Here it is. Here it is. The Get Wet Bladder. <laughs> Hey, that is a goon bag. That it's a giant is a bloody bag. two million litre bladder that was installed by Get Wet in the Pilbara, mate. Instead of instead of taking thirty minutes to fill up a seventy thousand litre water cart, the Get Wet bladder and the piping system and the flanges installed by Get Wet dropped it down to five minutes, 400 litres a second, down from 37 minutes. Mate, these bloody bladders, <laughs> no concrete pad required, probably no excavation permits, no working at heights, no scaffolding, which the Kiwis are going to be devastated about, no cranes like you'd need for a hard-sided tank to bloody put in. Just get the pad ready, have a look at that, and the Get Wet team can install these bladders and have it pumping water in there within a few hours. Few hours, mate. Matty, mate. it sounds it sounds like you're offering these companies free money again. Oh, mate, just give yourself a free bonus and get a Get Wet bladder. <laughs> Simple as that. They mate, they can make these bladders however you bloody want. How big, how small, depend, whatever you need. All the pipe and design, the poly welding, bloody everything. And lads, it sounds like a turnkey solution. But you don't need a tank. You just need 
bit of a you flat earth. To, you need to get wet. And a bladder. So, or a big goon bag. Mate, and ho- holy, <laughs> like, holy snap and duck shit, Trav. There is plenty of other features. I could do a full episode on how fucking good these get wet bladders are. Mate. Have, div- you, been, have you been using them as a pillow lately? Mate, you could, <laughs> mate. You can go have a bloody snooze on it at night if you haven't got enough dongers. Mate, just send half the camp out there. Give Matty Hall a buzz. Email is in the show notes. Just, boys, you've got to, companies have got to get smart. And get wet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks for get wet coming on board. And lads, did you notice anything special about that roller smashing out the get wet pad? Uh, I sure did, mate, but I wouldn't steal your thunder. Mate, because you know why? It was a roller of choice, not the roller specifically, but the bloody Brooks logo on it. <laughs> Whatever mine site that was, they had their shit together because they're using the Brooks group. First first step to being a successful, successful mining company, MD CEOs, listen up right now. Have Brooks yellow gear on site. Second step, make sure you're working night shift under an adequately, adequately illuminated arena made possible by Brooks Lighting Tower. Mm. Third step. Fly your bloody people up there on Brooks Airways and fourth step, go have crib in a Brooks donger and then have a bit of, you could have five to ten minutes me time afterwards in a Brooks shitter. <laughs> like, mate, and mate, this is just a tiny teaspoon from inside a massive salad bowl in context of what Brooks and Brooks Group, the Brooks Group does. It's, a uh, mate. <laughs> Stewie dropped off um, a beautiful plane the other day. He and- did. It turns out, mate, they even have Brooks wine. Oh, you know that? Unbelievable. What? Yeah. Unbelievable. God, more, more divisions coming out of Brooks. <laughs> Brooks, going down the Margaret River. Just don't be a bunch of sooks. Take action. Don't sort your life out and get Brooks. Don't be a sook. Use Brooks. <laughs> don't, be a, don't be a sook. Get Brooks. Buddy, we're gonna go, we're gonna be these sayings are gonna be plastered over everyone's website. So mate, boys, latest twist in the battle of Neanzaga. Oh god, I don't know if we can handle any more battles. Of course we can. What's going on? Well, mate, um I love I love the battle for Neanzaga. I just get, oh, I feel it in my bones. Ah! <laughs> uh, so Orcorp has uh, they, they they had their AGM finally last week. And remember our discussion on the last two resolutions put to shareholders at that AGM, namely I discussed resolution seven, which was to increase the maximum um, pool of, for, for non-executive director remuneration to 750K and resolution eight, which was to adopt a new employee incentive plan, which allowed for much more diluted provision of performance rights to employees than had been in place the preceding three years. Well, the results came in and it sure looks to me like Perseus was not supportive of those resolutions. Recall Perseus holds 19.9% of Orcorp or 93 million shares themselves. And you go to the results of meeting there and, um, you know, it's just more than more than that quantum is voted against in those res- resolutions. However, they still passed. Um, uh. And I assume Silver Corp, who own 15-odd percent, uh, voted, for, voted for those resolutions. So happy days for the, for the good guys there, mate. And yesterday, Orcorp dropped their target statement where they formalised their recommendation to reject, or, uh, reject the Perseus offer. And... Um, there was probably nothing all that new in this target statement, but I was I was keen to read up to see if I could figure out how those resolutions might actually f- flow through to the pockets of um, Orcourt Board and Management in a, in a change of control event. Take Resolution 7 first, which basically allows for an uplift in potential director remuneration, or, the, or at least the pool. So when I look at Clause 10.6 of the target statement, it reads to me pretty clearly um, that if a director's job is terminated due to a change of control, then they will have such entitlements, including compensation for loss of office as contemplated by their existing employment agreements. And as a reader, I read this, and even though I don't have the employment agreements in front of me, I can now understand the mechanism by which that resolution can return money to the directors. And then take resolution eight at the AGM, which effectively implemented an incentive plan that allowed for 2.5 times as many performance rights to be awarded in the future three years as the prior plan did for the three years before that. Well, this was an interesting one, right? Because I was trying to figure out how this could translate into dollars in the in the pocket of, of management when Perseus's bid and Silvercorp's bid were on foot based on a capital structure that didn't include more performance rights being issued. And then I found this in the target statement in quotation marks. Orcorp expects to pay retention payments in an aggregate amount not exceeding $1.9 million on the basis of the current timetable. And this sentence is footnoted 
go to the footnote and it says this. This aggregate amount is calculated by reference to eligible employees' current base salary, the anticipated award of performance rights under Allcorp's existing long-term incentive plan, and the anticipated time period over which the control transaction will continue to run. So to be clear, that existing employee incentive plan is the one that was just approved by shareholders in the middle of a live takeover, right? And it might seem petty that I'm bringing this up again, Matty JD, it, it, prob- it probably is petty. I, I am being petty. I'll admittedly say I'm petty. <laughs> But I got some pushback when I talked about this dynamic at Orcorp last time. Shout out to Weary, um, who, who absolutely fights the good fight for his for his clients. You got to respect it. You got to respect it. But uh, <laughs> but the pushback was Orcorp actually agreed to to not issue performance rights in 2024 because a potential change of control was at foot, which technically is true. But management effectively pocket more money when there is instead a cash retention payment which is calculated in reference to the enlarged performance rights issued from the incentive plan shoved through at the latest AGM. Rant over. <laughs> Come at me, Found Yuri. a way around it. <laughs> <laughs> Who'd have thought? Oh, the, this is like another battle itself. <laughs> the battle of investor relations. <laughs> oh, I love your work, Ricard Dinio. Bloody mate. We'd be lost without you. <laughs> Simple as, oh, mate. Mate, JD, first quantum. What's going on? Looking for a bit of cash. Mate, I thought it'd been a while since I'd spoken about first quantum, so why not get back into them? They're, uh, they're in the headlines because they're looking to potentially sell stakes in their Zambian assets. So they've got they Kansanchi and- They might have to start selling stakes soon if they don't sell enough well, copper. Well, we're going to we're going to get into it because they're still churning out a lot, but obviously they have a uh, a pretty sizable you know amount of debt which they've done an awful lot of work on to to clear up. So let's get into the uh, the financial position at the moment. They've been on a bit of a mad scramble to uh, to fix things up, and like I said, they've done a pretty good job. They've issued one point one five billion in US dollars worth of stock and one point six billion worth of notes in the past month alone. So those notes are paying a bit over nine percent and due in five years time. Now they uh, are going to use those notes to pay off what they had due in the next couple of years. So they've pushed back any sort of press- pressing debt concerns that they had, plus you know a bit of general corporate purposes in there as well. They also refinanced a bank facility which they had, which totaled two point two billion dollars. <throat> so that relieves the the covenant pressure, similar to what we spoke to about with Albemarle there, they pushed that away and they extended the term till 2027. They suspended their dividend as well and signed a prepay copper agreement with their major shareholder, Jiangji Copper, for $500 million. So they're now sitting with $2 billion in liquidity, which is a huge improvement to where it was a bit over a month ago. Net debt to EBITDA on their terms is 2.3 times. I don't think I'd be quite as generous with what they classify as net debt and kind of like Albemarle again, the EBITDA is adjusted there. Now that is still down from over five times pre the financing. So a big improvement, but like you said, Maddie, they, um, they might have to sell assets as well. So there's been articles written about them looking to sell the Las Cruces mine in Southern Spain. And I've also been hearing quite a bit about regional consolidation there along the Iberian pyrite belt. There's plenty of mines, Matzas in the area, Neves Corvo, which is Lundin mined, Aliustrel, which is Almina owned. And there's plenty more mines. You know, the, the famous old Rio Tinto mine is in the area too. So people have been talking for a while and I think it's getting a bit louder about consolidating that area. So... Las Cruces specifically, which is the first quantum mine, finished the open pit in 2021 and it's going underground. So they've just got the permits and everything. They're going to add 18 years in life to that once it gets cranking there. And I'm sure they'd also be amenable to selling their 70% interest at Ravensthorpe. What would you pay for it? (laughs) Although, well, in my notes I had written, you wouldn't be getting top dollar for that. I'm not sure how much you'd get, but it, it wouldn't be worth an awful lot given the uh, the current market. Although interestingly, they're still looking to press on and get a nickel mine that they have in Zambia nearby to their Kansanchi operations online in the near term. So honing in on those two mines that they have in Zambia, together they produced 350,000 tonnes of copper in 2023. So that made up half their production, the other half pretty much coming solely from Cobre Panama, which we'll get into. 
plus these Zambian assets chucked out 70,000 ounces of gold. So not bad at all. And the refinancing allows them to press ahead with expansions that they had at Kinsanchi, looking to lift at that mine production up to 180,000 tonnes of copper. So Wait, what, are you, what are you seeing in the, in the market just from the, the trading valuation and the share price movement? So I, t- I try to put it into perspective and see, you know, what the what the size of the business is, what their debt obligations were, what the forecasted earnings were. And you can't help but get the feeling, again, similar to Albemarle, that people just aren't so concerned. They're trading on almost 12 times forward EBITDA. Now, that is excessive on um, by any measure for, you know, a, a cyclical mining business. And they're up over 10% over the past couple of weeks. In that time period, they've obviously done that refinancing that I've I've touched on there. So it really indicates to me that a the the market is happy with the deleveraging that's taking place, and you know following on from that, they're happy with First Quantum's ability to tap capital markets and to to gather investor interest out there, and they've also got to be bullish on a outcome, a positive outcome at Cobre Panama. I'd so, love to I'd love to do it, do the math and sort of back out what the implied probability. Um, of a positive outcome at, at Cobra is based on its uh, market cap. Yeah, we should. I mean, we should get into that. It, it is fascinating to to see. It so much of it is up in the air because whilst I think they will get Cobra Panama back eventually, you know, not with super high conviction, but I do think they're going to get an outcome there. It's hard to say what the financial implications are. What I mean is, I think there'll be revised terms which they can operate the mine on. And you know who's to say what those revised terms look like in in the you know near term. I still think it's likely they'll press on with trying to sell some assets that they you know if they can get a decent price of them. I don't think there'll be any shortage of interest in those Zambian copper mines, and you know they'll want to do that so that they're not negotiating from a position of weakness. But you know importantly, there's president presidential as well as national legislative. Elections coming up in Panama in May of this year, and I think following on from that, we could see whilst these legal proceedings keep going on in the background, a renegotiation and a favourable outcome for First Quantum. Mate, they've still got the big lever to pull, picking up medallion at Ravensport. <laughs> <laughs> that prophecy still could come true. You just uh, never know. You know, First Quantum have an office here in Perth. Yeah, right. No one knows that. Well, I, no, one, no one talks about it. But yeah, they've got. Yeah, the, the um, start, oh, yeah. there's a Cameco one here too. Mm. Apparently, I did, I did not I know think, that. I think, think. I didn't know that. I did know the 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 head geos and you know some of the technical team for the Zambian operations are Perth based. Mate, it's all happening. For, for They're all content. coming to see us. Like it's <laughs> bloody. It's a no it's got, brainer. Got nothing to do with the concentration of talent here. <laughs> it doesn't trap. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about proximity. Right, PGEs, PGMs, what a platinum group medals. What is what's going on, JD? All righty, it's about time we uh, spoke about PGMs. They're they're down in the dumps at the minute, and if you look at a chart on any of the medals, you know, platinum, palladium, rhodium, any of them, they are down massively. So. Palladium is trading at levels last seen in 2018. This is on the back of weaker Chinese demand. There's been talk of destocking from manufacturers. EV growth is eating into the market as well, given that you know these uh, the the predominant use is catalytic converters. And it's also worth knowing that two thirds of production of platinum comes from South Africa, and about 80 percent of palladium production comes from South Africa and Russia. So, JD, let me guess the the palladium price you're referring to is not trading anywhere near the Chalice DFS number, mate. It's going very much in the the opposite direction of that Ooh. that study. So, not oh, good news not for good. them. But no doubt, I think uh, contrarian investors might start to get interested at these levels, and I'll I'll flesh out some of the news that's happened in the space recently. So both Sabanye Stillwater and Anglo-American Platinum, also known as Amplats, have been cutting jobs, 2,600 at Sabanye and 3,700 jobs at Amplats. Now that Sabanye figure was reduced from 4,000 after union negotiations. And they're also written down the value of some assets by $2.6 billion dollars. So pretty chunky. And then you've got Implats. They scrapped their divi. They cut CapEx by $500 million. They've restructured their Canadian operations and, you know, halved the lives over there. 
And if you, if you pull out this quote from the CEO, it, it doesn't look great. He says, if ongoing restructuring and cost cuts are not sufficient, you have no option but to consider putting operations on care and maintenance. So it's, uh, it's pretty grim out there. And why this might be of interest to ASX investors is that Implats are 87% shareholders of Zimplats. So Zimplats have a bunch of operations in Zimbabwe, as you could probably guess. Now, they've tried to consolidate that ownership a while back and multiple times, but that hasn't quite worked out for them. So Zimplats's stock is down almost 25% in you know a, a month or so. And we've also seen massive volume in the in the recent trading days, the biggest volume that we've seen in the past year. So the, the half year that came out late Feb was pretty grim. I'll, I'll rattle off some of the numbers. Revenue down 30 plus percent, net profit down 94 percent, after tax earnings from $159 million to an $8.7 million loss. And all this with production going up slightly and unit costs being pretty flat. So the outlook doesn't get any better in their half year results. Here's a comment from their boss. The company has instituted a number of survival strategies with stringent measures to contain costs and preserve cash. Now, good for them that they've got pretty minimal debt, all up about $60 million in a revolver and bank overdraft. But things are pretty tough, and I'm pretty keen to, to learn a lot more about the PGM industry. I'm not sure about you guys, but it's starting to look pretty interesting despite a lot of hardship out there. I've got a, well, I've got a couple of points here, mate. One is on the um, Zimplatz. Uh, yeah, and Implats dynamic. I'm, uh, obviously, Implats are the largest shareholder of Zimplats, but it was one of those cases where you had minority shareholders hold out way back in the day in a takeover, and, and hence there's a, you know a, a trading minority interest um, of, of Zimplats, which is still listed. And if if I'm not mistaken, one of the big players there that has a has a meaningful position and influence is um is the founder, this guy called Peter van der Spy. Um, yeah, so his uh his 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 influence might 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 influence whether or not implants can uh, actually acquire the the holdout share, shareholders you know two decades later or not and the other one is um one guy who knows a lot about pgms is keith good who's this um kind of independent geo on twitter i think he used to cover the whole sector including precious but um he, he tweeted the other day something interesting about has anyone thought about the potential that chalice could uh could take over uh, Nickel West Smelter and, and refine their product there, which is a pretty left field idea. Mm. Yeah, I saw that one. That was that was pretty interesting. And um, on your on your first point, you're you're dead right. I mean, the the Zimplat stock generally trades less than ten thousand shares a day, more or less, or mostly def, definitely less than fifteen thousand shares a day. So um, you know, even at a twenty odd buck share price, it's pretty pretty illiquid. Are you? Is there much? Is there a lot of leverage to hydrogen for PGMs because of the hydrogen transportation use? Is that where I got a, a lot of kicks going to come from? It's. I mean, it's hard to say. I mean, they're not getting any kicks lately. That could have been one of the uh, one of the boosters throughout that twenty one period where where prices were on the rise, and then the the Ukraine Russia conflict impacted the market massively as well that led to to prices you know rising even further but i feel you know a bit of the sting has come out of this hydrogen push in in recent times and perhaps that's you know playing into the pgm prices coming off across the board too mm, sabanio stillwater that you mentioned before is a bloody lever they can pull for a bit of cash money miners might know about mount lyle a copper mine in tasmania Keep your eyes out. Who who should buy it? Yeah. I'm pretty sure. Isn't there a big liability there? I'd say so. <laughs> Might get five bucks for it. I'm pretty sure it sold for less than five bucks. It was like like when, five bucks or five bucks bucks. Like actual. I'm pretty sure that Vedanta, who um, they entered a term sheet to divest Mount Lyle for literally like an option. It was an option agreement to New Century ultimately, who have since been acquired by Sabania. Hence, it's now Sabania's problem. But there was no upfront cash. It was just an option agreement. So I don't know if it's worth too much. Oh, geez, you just never know. You've got to be in it to win it. <laughs> it was a mighty Macquarie sale process, that one, where uh, the the people on the who, who sell the asset don't get paid 
because it's not a front consideration. <laughs> Get some options. Uh, right, the bankers come, would be spewing. Uh, <laughs> right, bit of drill. Yeah, well, let's talk about the drill bit going out there. They better be in K-drill holes, put it that way. Maybe maybe that's why the grade's a bit lower at the Wildcat hits because it mightn't have been a K-drill hole. Right, 119 <laughs> metres at 1% lith. Wildcat, lots not to like, but shit, down 11% on the news. Purely 2D interpretation here, boys, but look, it pinches either side of the intersection and it's 300 metres below the surface and it's only 1%. So you need that shit to be 1.2, 1.4 at least. Bloody, you know, so... It's hey. still pretty pretty, pretty striking, the share price reaction, don't you reckon? Or was it, mm. what do you think it was kind of justified? Yeah, well, I do. Lithium had its, um, had its run a bit last week, down a bit today, so probably a... Bit of a double whammy there. Ch- your mate Chucky uh, has tweeted, it won't take Wildcat too long to clock 100,000 metres of drilling exploring for patches of low-grade pegmatite near the centre of the earth. 300 metres, it's, it's not too deep, but it is a bit deep. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I reckon, lads, I reckon, on me to-do list, there is a big segment to do on batteries and EVs on the back of this lithium mania turned carnage and potentially coming back. Who bloody knows? But mate, Where's your but, interest? But between, just between the current lithium batteries that we know all good and well, but then these potential, there's lithium sulfur batteries, the, the sodium batteries that which don't need lithium, which cattle and BYD are chucking heaps of coin into, solid state batteries, uh, mate. And then you've got BMW, Toyota, Hyundai and Honda, they're investing heavily into hydrogen-powered motor vehicles. So, shitload of moving parts and permutations. It's on the to-do list, money miners. Mm-hmm. Matty, Matty needs to get up the curve and deliver the goods. But, shit, there's a lot of different ways this stuff could go. That <clears throat> or that BYD uh, sodium battery, that is, they're anticipating that to be their best-selling car, EV car. Like, it's very... They don't get the ra- as much range uh, as the lithium ones, but this apparently. It's funny when you read on batteries, you can read two different things on articles dependent on the incentives. Like one's up, <laughs> one's down. Who would have thought? But um, yeah, that yeah, could I think be you're, you're, one game changer. I think you're bang on. The, the sodium ion batteries have a, a significantly lower energy density than the, the norm at the minute. And that plant, that one and a half billion dollar plant that got the green light from cattle was done when lithium prices were through the roof and they thought these things would be relatively cheaper. But nevertheless, I'm super keen to to dig into all those things you mentioned and I think it'd be a, a ripper chat learning more about it myself. Yeah, right. One from uh, yesterday, Spartan. Hey, anyone still got shares? Ding, ding, ding. I've got oh. a couple left over still. Oh, yeah. a couple of dribs and drabs. Jeez, a bloody... Uh, if only I held on. Uh, mate, Spartan exploration hits. Let's check this out. 11 and a half metres at 36 grams per tonne at titled one kilometre deep, but it's actually 830 metres deep, one kilometre down dip along the ore body. So a bit of, there's a bit of mayo on that. But, um, mate, she's uh, she's coming along. The good thing, the good thing for Spartan here, so I'll bring up, bring up the uh, looking – along the strike, like at the strike length of the ore body is the increased strike length at depth. Cause it was one of, I guess the issue with the initial never, never drilling was that hundred meter strike, strike length of the ore body, the ounce per vertical meters. So, but you can, you look down at the bottom here, it looks like the load strike has significantly increased to a bit over 300 meters. So more ounces per vertical meter, but they are deep. But I look, here's some high level illustration for the mining side, I sure hope that there is a way they can punch an initial decline from the bottom of that Gilby's pit. So look, it, look from there, venture over to the foot wall of the ore body, and then they can incline and decline off that to get multiple mining fronts happening in the Never Never load simultaneously. Get to that 300 metre juicy strike section a bit quick, quicker, join it up to a decline from the surface from the top part of Never Never, more mining fronts, more ore to try and fill the mill. Don't know if there's any, don't know if there's any constraints uh, to be able to do this, not to go in from the Gilby's pit, but let's hope they find a way. Be interested to yeah, see mine love- design when it comes out because 
I like that illustration a lot better than the um, that's high the, level than the hollowed out uh, image of Burj Khalifa next to the uh, <laughs> next to the section here. <laughs> I was just about to mention they've moved on from the from the A three eighty onto Burj Khalifa. Oh, oh, yeah, it's I either know. it's either bloody um what, what are the two you always see the it's either like the Burj Khalifa or it's um the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Yeah. So that yeah. line you see that picture there that's that decline will be on the. Yeah. That other side yes. of the ore body or the which I don't know which side the football side, mate. But uh, look, LinkedIn post from Simon Lawson today. Spartan market cap five hundred and fifty mil, thirty nine million cash. No debt gives me an EV of five hundred and eleven million. At Aussie thirty two hundred gold with zero point nine five million ounces of high grade. On a granted mining lease. Boys, who needs S&P or Comsec when you've got the daily LinkedIn market update from Spartans MD, Simon Lawson? Loves Thanks for service in the industry, Simon. (laughs) Love your bloody work. Good on the promote. (laughs) Good stuff. Oh, mate. Uh, Great bloody show, lads. Speaking of promote, Jesus Christ, I love promoting our partners, (laughs) especially our new one, Get Wet. Give Matty Hall a buzz if you want to get wet bladder on your site. <laughs> Mate, uh, we've also got Verified, DSI, Underground, Smack Power and Technology, Anytime Exploration Services, KCA Site Services, the roller you seat before putting the get wet pad in the Brooks Group, Brooks Airways, Brooks High, Brooks Equipment, and our great friends at K Drill. Love your work, Money Miners. Money Miners. Hoodaroo. Hoodaroo. The information contained in this episode of Money of Mine is of general nature only and does not take into account the objectives, financial situation or needs of any particular person. Before making any investment decision, you should consult with your financial advisor and consider how appropriate the advice is to your objectives, financial situation and needs.